I used to sell Task Importer Studios that I'd refurbished on eBay, a question that I'd often get from people who were interested in buying the unit was, is there any wear on the heads? So there's four heads here. Can you see a difference between them? You can probably see a difference now. In fact, all three of these are fucked, and this one's alright. And I just don't think that there's any way to tell from the surface. Now, I don't want to present myself as uh, an expert here. I mean, I presumably know a bit more about fixing up Porter Studios, having fixed up about 200 of them now, than a lot of people in my audience. But there's always something you haven't seen before. I've been doing it long enough to know that. But I figure that if lapping, physical wear of the surface of the head were something that happened at the very low tension and very low tape speed that cassette multi-trackers operate at, if that was a thing, I probably would have come across it by now. That isn't the issue that I've had when tape heads break. When I have had bad tape heads, it's because inside... I wonder how well we can actually see in here. Maybe it'll make more sense if I showed you the board that's broken off. I think this goes with this one. But basically these little uh, printed circuit boards, these little white bits are the mountings for tiny little coils of wire. I mean, basically what you've got here is one, two, three, four little electromagnets. There's a ferret core and then a coil of wire around that. Uh, um, these little sort of horizontal partitions. They're just keeping this pair and this pair electrically isolated from each other. And then the design of this casing is such that uh, the magnetic field that's created by each of these four little electromagnet can only come out of one of these four slots. And that's how you get the tape broken into four regions. But the issue that I've had with uh, heads for <laughs> I'm trying to cover my fingernails here. I should have cleaned them before I did this. I've, I've, had, I've been doing work outdoors, okay, guys? Like, I'm not that filthy. But, um, yeah, the problem I've had is that these break. Right, here's one. You can see that it's about to break. In fact, I'll probably just twist it and it'll come off now. I mean, it is definitely a phenomenon with faster real, real players you know, like ones that are doing seven and a half inches per second and up. And certainly when you get um, these like, you know, two inch tape formats that they use in professional studios where it's like 30 inches per second, the way I read about it, or maybe it was explained to me, I don't remember, but uh, you've got to think like the tape's almost like sandpaper. Like there's loads and loads of little metal particles. And if they're passing at high tension twice as fast or in some instances you know, eight to ten times as fast as the higher speed that you get on cassette multi-track recorders. If that's passing over a head and uh, the tape machine's in professional use, so it's like being played or recorded maybe six to eight hours a day, five, seven days a week. So after a time, um, if you think that there's going to be, you know, a head that's like four times the size of this and was wider with a lot more of these little uh, partitions on it, maybe after years of use, then that head is going to become physically worn. I just haven't come across that with Porta Studio heads. It's just this problem where little electromagnet inside isn't connected anymore, or it's come loose of its housing. And I've demonstrated before that you can just uh, test for continuity. So if I turn my meters here and go into continuity mode, If an array's head like that, you'll actually hear the beep. Um, it's probably going to be below 10 ohms. Here I've got the record playback head from my 244, which I know is all right. Um, if I plug in one of the channels here, it's not going to beep, but it's not going to show overloads on the meters here. It's going to, I think it's 170 ohms, something like that. There we go. 171.2 ohms. The way the continuity works, if the resistance is below 50 ohms, it'll beep. But if you break the circuit, if I pull that out, I'll show OL, short for overload. That brings me to all these various bits of gubbins that were lying around in shot earlier on. I figure if you're trying to fix a Porter Studio or other multi-track cassette recorder, what you need to know is not as sophisticated as what a circuit designer would need to know. We can assume that when these units went to market, leaving the factory in the 80s or 90s or whenever they were made, they worked well. So 
when we've got problems with them 20, 30 years on, it's because some of the components in a good, well-designed, functioning circuit aren't working properly. So really our job is to find out which bits aren't working properly and replace them. That's really our only job as amateur technicians. But a couple of times recently, I found myself with either a dead playback or I'm not getting recording on their channel or or one channel out of four isn't erasing properly. And so the conundrum for me trying to fix the machine is which link in the chain is broken? Is it because the magnetic head isn't touching the cassette properly? So, you know, that'd be a mechanical problem. Maybe there's something up with the pinch roller. You know, something's obstructing the tape path. Is it that the head itself is broken? Is it the cable connecting the head to the circuit board that's broken? Or is it some sort of component, leaky capacitor, dry joint, faulty operational amplifier actually in the audio path in the circuit? So that thing with the continuity tester gives you a relatively simple yes, no, is that little electromagnet inside there still intact kind of a test. It's not always convenient to stick wires into one of these plugs or even to get to the, the contacts on the base of the head. So I want to have a way that I can be able to send a signal in or receive a signal out of one of these without completely disassembling the unit. And doing that allows me to differentiate between the head's actually broken or it's just the tape isn't touching the head properly. We know already that these can have a dual function, that they can transmit or receive magnetic fields because otherwise this combined record and playback head wouldn't work. So the, the reason for this ravaged cassette shell is um, I, I wanted to be able to just put this in to like push up the record enable and the cassette detection switches that are in these two corners of most cassette players. That way I can put this in a playback mode or in record pause mode. And then I can use this little two track erase head as a probe. So, you know, I can put it up against the playback head. Maybe this is connected. See, I've uh, wired up this RCA cable and I've wired up this little head with two male DuPont wires. So I can plug this in here. Here's a tone generator. What I could also do is, you know, if I've got the right connectors, I could plug that into the headphone socket of my phone. So maybe I've got my tune coming out of my mobile phone. So I can press that up against the playback head and see if that's going to send a signal into the Porter Studio. Because if I'm not getting a signal on one channel, it might be that the head's actually okay. It's just that the head, for some mechanical reason, isn't touching the tape. So, sorry, I'll just role play this a little bit better. Say this is the head of the machine. So, it's going to be up in this position because the unit's tricked into thinking that we're in playback mode because I've got this dummy cassette shell in. So, I'll touch that against there. This is transmitting my test tone and my music. And then I see if the needles or the VUs move, or maybe I've actually got it hooked up via the line out to external speakers, or I've got headphones plugged in. And so, I can see if this is going to receive a signal or maybe I've got one channel that's not erasing and I don't want to completely deconstruct the machine to test uh, for the bias signal, the erase bias coming out of the erase socket on the printed circuit board. So if instead I hook this up to, I don't know, an oscilloscope, um, I won't actually role play the leads here, but um, that's hooked up to an oscilloscope. So I press that up against the raise head. My uh, invisible hypothetical Porter Studio is in record pause mode. So I press that up against there and see if I can see the, you know, 80 kilohertz bias signal coming out of that head. Say it's channel four that's giving me trouble. If I only record arm channel four, if I can pick up a signal there, that shows that it is coming out of the head. And the problem is between the physical contact between the head and the cassette itself. These other bits and pieces I've got lying around. This came from an old Iowa cassette recorder that I pulled out of a skip. Uh, prior to that, I did try and make my own electromagnet. So this is just some old cable wrapped around a conductive screw. That worked a little bit. You have to sort of 
push the metal tip up against the head in order to transmit or receive the signal. This worked a bit better from the same Iowa tape player. This is one of two solenoids that was used to respond to the user buttons, um, pull levers and so on and control what mode it's in. The inner core is back to front and it's held in place with some double-sided tape. I can hook that on there. So I could plug that into whatever, say it's my tone generator. You would touch that part up against the head and that would transmit the tone into the head. This array's head produced the loudest signal and also I had to be least exacting about how these two things are lined up in order to get a signal. And uh, here's a demonstration of this sort of thing working. Here's my tone generator. I've got it set to zero decibels, so it's like a relatively loud signal. So we can pick this up properly. Um, here's a head that I know works. You can hear that's live. So I've got this little uh, jerry-rigged DuPont cable to quarter inch jack cable coming out of the pins of this head. This is going to add a bit of distortion, but for our purposes it doesn't matter. And then the output's just going straight into the input of my powered monitor. So. <laughs> as soon as I demonstrate it, the solder's broken. I'm now hooking directly onto this uh, with female to female and DuPont wires that are going to this male to male DuPont wire to RCA thing that I've soldered together to go into my test generator. I mean, you just have to kind of put together whatever connection needed for whatever sound source you're going to use. Uh, 40 hertz and 10k you can't really hear if I just change between the 400 and 1 kilohertz signal that at least proves that that is where that signal comes from it's a little bit temperamental trying to get the like segment of this that's transmitting um, lined up with the segment that's receiving on this head there's absolutely no fidelity to it, but it's just another sort of simple yes-no test. It's like, is this head under test receiving or transmitting the signal that I want it to? And from that information can tell whether there's a problem with the head or with physical contact with the tape. I'm probably repeating myself at this stage. Um, but anyway, I hope that's kind of gives you some sort of insight into how these things work and the sort of things you can do to help diagnose which components in a system aren't functioning properly. Right, here I am using, it's a different head, this is an old one from a 44 Mark III. I was just finding I couldn't really make a solid connection to that little two-track erase head, it just kept on breaking. Um, but you know, this works more or less as well, it's a little bit wider. This is just hooked up via male-to-male -male DuPont cables to crocodile clips that are going into the input on the oscilloscope. 10 microseconds is the width of each of the segments on the x-axis and it's uh, 0 0.1 volt for each segment up and down the way. I press that up against there, pull this down so you can see me turning on the arm signals. Clearly this head is lined up with track 2, so when I turn on track 2 we're seeing the bias signal. For track 2 the bias signal is definitely reaching the erase head. So then I can just change which pair of pins this is inserted into. Okay, that beeping is my multimeter telling me that it's about to turn itself off. There we go, there's channel one. Oh, well that's also picking up channel three. You can see channel four coming on there as well. Ray's head seems to be picking up all four of these. Channel three is most closely aligned there because you're getting the largest amplitude. The size of the readings and everything isn't really important here. I'm just showing you this as a means to check that the bias signal is actually getting as far as the arrays head. So like for instance on this Marantz I've got a problem where track 4 isn't erasing properly. But you can see that the signal's present. 
that it's the same voltage coming out of all four pins on the panel of the printed circuit board. So if it's not erasing then that suggests to me that there's something about the way that the tape and the head are making contact with each other or something to do with the tape path rather than to do with the um, bias production system or the magnetic head.